I'd like to start by thanking all those who have been uh, participating in the initiatives of this uh, festival and who uh, unfortunately haven't found a place in this uh, room and uh, uh, currently they are also in uh, Piazza Duomo. Thank you so much uh, for your interest. Uh, a round of applause for the participants and for the attention shown for the initiatives of the festival. These have been three and a half very intensive days when we have discussed very relevant questions in depth. And in the light of the things said, we were actually watching the real life which was uh, uh, described by eminent people. We had, for example, the president of the union, Varun Poi, who some days ago said uh, that perhaps the most critical um, part uh, of uh, the crisis uh, has been overcome. Uh, probably Varun Poi was referring to the question that uh, tension has decreased in the financial markets and the spread, the so-called uh, spread is something that we are not uh, uh, talking about uh, so much uh, in these uh, last months. Uh, now, if this is true, it is also true that the situation of uh, so-called real economy, the situation of families, households, and data or on unemployment are still tragic. Um, we have recently uh, analyzed and seen uh, the latest uh, data on uh, unemployment in Italy, youth unemployment, uh, which perhaps uh, which uh, is uh, four times uh, higher than uh, normal uh, employment. So we are. Uh, well, perhaps the most acute phase has been overcome, but the crisis that we are going through is still very fierce, and we have to face it. We cannot afford to remain in the stalemate. We need to go on. I think that all the presentations in this festival, all the lectures were very constructive, and many scholars told us what needs to be done. Someone referred to the need to split up banks in Europe. There are some banks which are very big, even bigger than the national GDP of some countries. And some other scholars said we need to act on the debt. We need to intervene because there is a perverse relationship between public debt and the banking system. And we need to go beyond the banking crisis. And then uh, some uh, scholars uh, spoke about uh, the development of the banking union. And uh, many uh, others have spoken about uh, the European Central Bank, uh, which is a supranational entity. And then uh, some other scholars uh, spoke about uh, the op op possibility of uh, uh, upgrading and uh, uh, increasing the size of uh, uh, the institutions and the role of institutions uh, in Europe. And many have underlined uh, that this process will uh, uh, inevitably require some loss of sovereignty. But these uh, losses of sovereignty will have to be agreed upon as uh, underlined also in uh, the meeting with uh, Mario Monti and Sylvie Goulard, it will have to be voluntary and uh, symmetrical without necessarily having to go through the very heavy experience uh, um, as uh, Sylvie Goulard uh, said, uh, the um, very bad experience of the EU Troika when uh, uh, Troika imposed its policies on Greece. Now, I think that during this festival, we had a very in-depth discussion on many interesting topics, and I'm sure that this uh, will leave a mark uh, in uh, our um, work and in the work uh, of uh, uh, politicians. Uh, 
as well because we think that we have uh, gone forward uh, in the discussion. But of course, uh, there is also another way, which is uh, uh, to go back. Uh, to rethink uh, and to uh, really discuss uh, whether it is worth uh, going on uh, with uh, just one single currency or whether some countries uh, should uh, uh, think about exiting the euro. And uh, this will be the topic of this uh, conclusive, uh, uh, concluding lecture. We have uh, Professor James uh, Merlis, uh, who received a Nobel Prize in 1996 together with William Bickel for his contribution on the theory of incentives. And his contribution dates back to 1971. That really changed the way of thinking about taxation. And it's a contribution telling us how governments can impose taxes considering that uh, citizens uh, have information uh, that the government uh, doesn't have and can use this information to change uh, the signals uh, and uh, they can react uh, by reducing uh, the supply of uh, work uh, in the case uh, of uh, too high taxation. That was a fundamental contribution which changed the way of uh, uh, thinking about these issues. Uh, in, uh, so 1971 is really a landmark uh, in the uh, scientific production. There is an article together with uh, Diamond, another Nobel laureate, uh, a very important uh, article on taxation and uh, uh, efficiency, corporate efficiency. So those are contributions uh, which are very relevant and which changed uh, our way of thinking about these issues. And it is no chance uh, that Professor Merlis uh, also gave a definitive contribution, a very important contribution to, uh, at a political level, he was uh, uh, advisor to the Labour Party in the UK, uh, particularly on the topic of taxes. And uh, last year, just to demonstrate uh, the importance of James uh, Merlis' uh, works, uh, the IMS, uh, which is a very important uh, uh, center, the research center, uh, uh, an advisory center, uh, which uh, proposes uh, recipes uh, to change uh, taxation systems. Well, th that center decided to uh, title the, its report on the reform of taxation. Uh, well, that uh, was, uh, uh, the title was uh, Merley's uh, uh, report. Uh, uh, I don't want to take away further time from our speaker, and I give the floor straight away to Professor Merley's. This should work. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for your very kind words. Uh, I think I should start by underlining that whatever reputation I have as an economist, it is for... Uh, no, no, I, I, I hold it for you just no. one second. Then, then we will get something else. We'll get, we'll get, uh, we'll get the mic. We'll get the mic. We can get, we will get the mic. Aspettiamo un minuto. Lo diciamo anche per rispetto alle persone che ci seguono. Just uh, one moment. Uh, we. Arrange for a microphone and then uh, we'll start again. Right. <laughs> I was just explaining that uh, I'm known as a microeconomist, as uh, knowing something about incentives. And here I am talking about macroeconomics in an area as far away from these issues of taxation and, and other incentive issues as you might expect. So I mention that as a kind of a health warning. Uh, I find myself taking rather an extreme position 
on the current problems of Europe. Uh, but at least I, I, I want you to think about this as, uh, as a, possible, a possible view. Uh, and uh, I, I do think it would be very important to get some kind of more precise evaluation of the costs and benefits involved in different kinds of policies. Uh, biologists have a nice, simple view of what to do if you're faced with an attack. Two possible policies, uh, fight or flee. And that's the title that I have given this talk because I think that the, the countries of Europe, which is most of them, that have excessively high unemployment, uh, are having an experience that is for many very like an attack. And the question is what can be done about it? And I think there are two possible reactions. Uh, there are actually three because one of them is just to let the current policies of Europe be continued. But uh, apart from that, there is a possible fight policy and there is a, a flee policy. Flight would be to go back to your previous currency and no longer have the fixity to other currencies in, in Europe through the euro. Uh, fighting would be something about the, the way in which a country or a group of countries might bargain with the European Central Bank, with uh, the, the governments that have the wherewithal to give loans, to finance expenditure, and so on. Uh, so both of these might be considered, and I will argue at the end that essentially the, the method of fighting is one in which you look at this alternative policy of fleeing and say, is that what you want us to do? Uh, and if you will not finance a proper expansion of Europe, then we will have to do it. Now to continue. Uh, remind you, not really necessary, since you've probably been listening to talks about the, what I here call an economic downturn that uh, is uh, virtually a depression. Uh, you've been hearing about this uh, throughout the conference. Well, it started in the USA and is normally dated at about 2007, though some things were happening sooner. And it spread quickly to some countries and slowly to others, and not at all to many, unless it's perhaps happening now even in parts of, of Asia and the developing world. The developing countries, in fact, have been uh, remarkably little affected, which makes you wonder whether the world is as tied together by trade as we had thought. But there was certainly a large impact in Europe, and it's Europe that I'm thinking about today. And this depression, recession, downturn, crisis is not going away. So one thing I will have to comment on is why at least I think it's not going away. And uh, we obviously have to think about what governments could possibly do. Uh, surely they can do something. And we should think about why they don't. What's the problem? Well, of course, slow growth, which is one of the first things that gets mentioned, particularly since uh, there's even been decline in from time to time in some of the economies. I'll show you some numbers. And there's been a big increase in the fragility of debt. Uh, 
the risk of default seems very great and uh, many people have found that it would cost them a very great deal to borrow and these are indeed serious problems and of course there has been the unemployment but, and I'm going to take the view that that is the real problem and the serious problem uh, however as a result of all that there have been these austerity policies which mean poorer public services and that is a, a further secondary but not unimportant problem but of these as I say I think the big problem is unemployment however let's first just remind ourselves what's been happening in terms of GDP growth uh, Notice this peculiarity that there is one year that was notably bad, 2009, uh, with uh, substantial negative growth. But at that point, of course, it seemed that the problems were going away very fast. Just one year's decline and that was it. Uh, and then back to a growth rate that, though not impressive, was not so different from what uh, Europe had been experiencing earlier in, in the century. But then, of course, more recently, decline again. So that verifies that the problem is not going away. Uh, then, uh, one reason for listing all the different countries there, and I don't expect you to read all of this in detail or anything, is uh, just to emphasize that there's a considerable difference in experience, even in terms of GDP. Of course, we all know that Greece has had a terrible time, uh, <coughs> with a, a growth rate still getting pretty close to negative 7% a year. Uh, and you just wonder where that can go. But uh, an another feature is that apart from the year 2009, Nobody's uh, negative growth rate goes really too far. A decline of a couple of percent in a year is not a very serious problem in itself, provided it's not going to go on and on. So uh, you might well think, looking at these, that uh, a number of countries have uh, been doing not too badly, Poland being an obvious case of the ones that I have listed. And Germany, for that matter, apart again from that strange year 2009, seems to be in a moderately healthy position. And if you, if you look at debt, at national debt, well, of course, there it depends very much how, how important this issue is. Italy seems to have been 120% or so for a long time. I haven't looked back to see how long. And uh, of course that's always been there on the horizon as something to worry a bit about. But uh, honestly, it's hard to see that it has been in itself a major problem. Uh, and you look at the figures, striking thing is, I'm not gonna bother showing you a table of this because I know that other people will have been talking about debt issues. Um, the UK is a bit of an outlier in having its debt rising from 50% of GDP to over 100% of GDP. But that's what happens if you buy banks and if you don't put the value of the banks, which admittedly might have for a time been rather low, into your balance sheet. And you don't quote, national debt is not quoted net. It's just one side of the, of the balance sheet. But why should one worry about debt? If you follow Paul Krugman in the New York Times, he's been trying to stop you worrying about debt for a while, and there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, of course, default risk. Uh, there's a sense that the, the bigger a country's national debt, the more likely it is to find that it must default. Uh, and that's a perfectly reasonable view. Uh, but the, the usual argument is that it's really rather naughty to have too much debt. Uh, that it's a, a sign that the government 
just spends when it feels like it and isn't subject to a reasonable control that uh, would say that it costs something to get money from people and you should spend it with care. Uh, I, again, with the case of Greece, there's something in that argument, but I think it is seriously overstated. Now, famously, of course, the Reinhardt and Rogoff had a, a paper when they, they got a bit careless, but the real point of their claim that countries with high debt run into falling growth is that uh, most of us would think of the causality as going the other way. We know perfectly well that when a country finds that its national debt gets rather large, it is likely to follow rather restrictive policies. It, uh, there are a whole variety of reasons why. In particular, it is having to pay interest on the debt, and that uh, affects its opinion on how much it can spend in, in real terms. So the, the got, the, they, I think, had mentioned, but not uh, sufficiently strongly, that perhaps the causality went the other way around. But uh, it's as well to remind ourselves that even now they, they claim that there's something to be found in the statistics, and again, it would be surprising if there wasn't. But it doesn't have the implication that uh, you, you mustn't let debt get too large. But here's the real problem, the unemployment, uh, which is now, of course, over 12% in the euro area. So first thing I'd want to emphasize here to remind you is not just that unemployment is high, but that it's rising, and it's still rising. And that has to be taken very seriously. Uh, on, on top of that, of course, youth unemployment is high, much higher, and uh, youth unemployment is rising. Uh, however, it's also very important, very important for my argument later on, that you notice what you're probably well aware of, that some countries, although they may have fairly high unemployment, don't have rising unemployment, and indeed, well, you look at the German case there, which comes immediately below France. Uh, Germany's highest unemployment was back in 2005 and 2006, in this period. And it's been fairly steadily falling until quite recently uh, throughout this period that is supposed to be the crisis period. Uh, I know, by the way, that the figure for unemployment here is different from the figure that Richard Portis quoted yesterday evening. Uh, Germany apparently publishes uh, a figure that is done on a different basis from the standard ILO comparison figure. Um, and this is the figure that, you, uh, that is the more standard figure uh, that, for example, you get in the back of The Economist. Um, Greece certainly has had very fast rising unemployment. Uh, Ireland, I don't know, I've uh, seen people say, oh, Ireland has turned the corner, they're doing fine now. And you look at these unemployment figures and wonder, what is it that people care about? And that is a point I will come back to towards the end of the talk. Italy, as you see, uh, is not by any means the, the worst hit of countries, but uh, an unemployment rate of over 10% is not good. However, if you ignore the last year, things seem to be fairly steady, around 7%, barely affected by, the, uh, by what's going on in, in the crisis. Uh, Poland, similarly, highest levels of unemployment, again until the most recent period, were uh, a while ago, and probably moderated most by the opportunity to move to the rest of the European Union. Uh, Spain, however, well, I would use Spain as a very important case, 
because Spain, I think, shows is very clearly an example of a country that has had a big increase in unemployment rather rapidly. And therefore, there can be little doubt that unemployment there is, in the fullest sense, involuntary. That's to say that, in principle, the jobs are there. The capacity to use workers is there because people had been doing things and then they've been thrown out of work in very large numbers. Uh, but it also needs to be noted that that is, while that's clearly true of Greece as well, there aren't that many countries of which that is unambiguously true. So the picture that we have is uh, of a, a lot of countries with unemployment a, a bit higher than it should be, or that it is in countries like Austria or Finland, where, uh, which show what is possible. Uh, but uh, other countries which have had sharply rising unemployment, and uh, these are the ones who are really suffering most from the current problems. Of course, I've got the UK in at the bottom, and I'm certainly not intending to neglect the UK. It is an important fact that the UK, with its independent exchange rate, still has a pretty unfortunate unemployment record, although it's a long way from being the worst. Oh, increased unemployment and the reduced growth you get is the result of falling demand. But the two things, uh, growth and unemployment, are not well correlated. Investment actually fell pretty sharply in many countries at the beginning of the recession because financial institutions reduced lending. And the, the banks stopped doing their business. Uh, they charge very high interest rates or in many cases totally unwilling to lend. They suddenly got very frightened of ordinary loans for actually doing things, uh, having been um, caught lending enormous amounts to others who weren't going to do anything with it except lend it. And then, of course, these funny assets, the derivatives and, the, uh, and various other forms of, of leverage, uh, they crashed. Uh, well known why, and uh, it's quite common to blame everything on the crash of house prices in the United States or in parts of the United States. Uh, though actually, I think part of the problem was that there were other depressing things happening simultaneously, namely the high prices of commodities, particularly oil, which is, uh, is something that pretty reliably induces a recession. And no doubt that, to some extent, brought about the crash of uh, house prices. Now, I wanted to emphasize this relationship between investment and unemployment. And I, I, I think that the best way to, to show it is that it's where investment fell. The numbers along the horizontal axis uh, the ratio of investment in 2011 to investment in 2006. It so happened that 2011 was the last year I could get the investment figures for when I was uh, putting this together. But I had unemployment much more recently and I thought I'd use that. So I've got the, the ratio of unemployment in 2013 to unemployment in 2006 on the vertical axis. Um, that means that if you're towards the left-hand end of the diagram, that's low investment, and it's investment that has fallen sharply. You can see there are countries where investment went down by more than 50%, actually over 60% in two cases. And uh, these countries are the ones that had a big increase in unemployment sometimes an enormously big increase. Um, in fact, the relationship would be even stronger if I hadn't 
didn't have India and China in this diagram. The two outliers on the right are developing countries, uh, which are interesting. It's interesting to know how that works, but you'd expect things to be different. So this is just a reminder that the basic Keynesian point that uh, investment, which might well be thought of as something that varies independently and is rather hard to control, is what then generates or doesn't generate the demand for goods and services that will bring people into employment. Well, the best thing to do with the current situation would be to restore investment levels to what they would have been if there hadn't been any kind of recession. If that could be done, then, like uh, an elastic band, it would just come back to where you want. Not instantly, but quickly. But that appears to be very difficult, precisely because investment is low as a result of the unwillingness of banks to lend. Uh, no doubt there are some other reasons now, but at least initially that appears to be in the major effect. And the United States had a lot to do with that. Um, monetary policy, even including quantitative easing, has uh, failed to do anything to these investment levels, and that is really to be expected. Uh, uh, why do I claim it's expected? People say, you bring the interest rate down to 0% nearly. Uh, surely that will encourage people to borrow. Um, but the crucial question is, will it encourage banks to lend? And uh, if uh, banks and increasingly investors themselves think that the prospect for growth and demand are very poor, then they're not going to see any point in investing if they're not going to be able to sell what they produce. The rate of return to these investments would be very negative. And so even a zero rate of interest is not going to encourage. Uh, I, I mention now, although it's, no, it's not the main point of what I'm talking about this afternoon, that uh, this means that it's very important to think of ways in which investment could be encouraged. Uh, one way is by loan insurance of one form or another, and some of that has been done in both America and Britain. But typically, like all of the policies adopted in the West, it's been too little, much too little, and perhaps also too late. Another way is uh, actually establishing new public lending institutions. Uh, nationalizing banks should work that way, but in fact seems not to have been used that way. In the developing countries, in India and China, the, then the banks kept lending. And indeed, uh, government policy insisted they should. The banks were publicly owned. I think that is no coincidence. And now, of course, businesses maybe don't want to invest because they don't think that uh, we're going to get out of this recession anytime soon. And consumers are saving. Saving has gone up in Britain, probably other places as well, because consumers should be becoming more pessimistic as well. So uh, none of this helps. It takes demand in the wrong way. In many countries, of course, as you saw in the picture, unemployment was high all along. Well, maybe that's because capital investment in these countries didn't actually create enough jobs. Why might they not create enough jobs? Uh, maybe wages are too high. Maybe minimum wages have that effect. And certainly a lot of people believe that that has been a major influence. And it may well be the reason why in Germany, for example, uh, we, we didn't see any impact, but unemployment still remains too high. Regional differences are certainly pretty great. Uh, you compare West and East Germany, which is 
substantial difference. Uh, East Germany has an unemployment rates more over 12 percent, more like the European average. Uh, unlike the rest of Germany at around 6 percent, uh, or the northwest of Europe compared to the south of Europe. Restoration of investment would still leave a problem, in fact. And one day, low interest rates should indeed help. They should get investment levels up. Uh, and that's a, at a time when it would be important to cancel out monetary expansion. But uh, that's a little way ahead yet. Of course, you can't help thinking that there is always an issue whether you particularly need the fast growth. This all seems to be about growth of GDP. Uh, why might you begin to think that that's not really needed all that much? Uh, because the average income that we're talking about is perfectly fine. It's just that uh, some people at the lower end have uh, terribly low incomes. But uh, the other problem is, of course, the environmental issues that are raised by the growth and uh, the problem of the pressure that we'll have to put on uh, developing countries not to pollute in the same way that uh, we've been doing. But again, that's not today's topic. What can be done? That's the question. Uh, of course, the other thing that can be done if you can't somehow restore investment levels, which would be great, is to expand government demand. And that, or, or I should perhaps put it a little different, to have government deficits because this can be done either by big expenditures. People talk a lot about infrastructure investments, which may not be the best idea because they can take quite a while to be carried out. And really what you're looking for is an expansion of demand that happens for however long it takes to get private sector demand up again to where it was. And it might not take very long. So there's a query as to whether infrastructure is the right thing. If it weren't, that that's what public sector does. Um, the other thing it could do, of course, is to reduce taxation to, or increase benefits even better. Wherever demand expands, the impact will be partly local. That's one of the things that is implicit in that picture that shows the relationship between the fall of investment and the rise of unemployment. Because uh, if, if demand just spread all over the world uh, and wasn't localized to the place where you actually increase incomes or spending, then uh, you wouldn't see this kind of association within countries. But there's certainly quite a strong local effect, which means, put it simply, that if you're going to increase employment in Italy, then to a large extent you have to have increased spending in Italy. Uh, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the government has to run well, it does mean the government has to run the deficit in a sense, but it could be financed by loans from elsewhere in Europe. However, it does mean the deficit. Uh, however, there is also the spread of demand to other countries, sometimes called leakage, but in these circumstances where many countries share the unfortunate fate of each of them, uh, spillovers with uh, demand deficit uh, by government in one country helping neighboring countries by increasing demand there as well, well then that's fine. And uh, it does strongly suggest that countries should discuss with one another and cooperate. If expansion is big enough though, and perhaps that doesn't mean a lot bigger than it is now, well there isn't any now, 
You would expect inflationary pressure in what I'll call the tight economies. Northwest of Europe, the Alpine countries like Switzerland, Austria, countries that don't have serious unemployment. And I already mentioned that Germany may well be an example of this. And Italy may be an example as well. These may be countries where the, the jobs are not there waiting to be filled if only there is sufficient demand for the products of the factories and, and building sites. Uh, these may be countries where new investment is required in order to create the jobs, and there things cannot happen too quickly. Now, there is a very serious problem, and that is why I'm coming to the conclusion that I am. To divert demand to economies with excess capacity, how, how can you do that? You see what's needed? You, uh, you have an increase in demand somewhere. Ideally, all the increase goes to the countries that actually have excess capacity, that can draw workers immediately into jobs. How do you divert it? Well, that's why relative prices between the different countries matter. That's, of course, why one of the policy initiatives that has been undertaken now has been to reduce wages in uh, a number of the Mediterranean countries. Uh, apparently not enough, but of course the big problem with doing this is if that's all you do, you make things worse. You reduce wages, you reduce demand to the extent that prices don't fall as much as the wages. And of course, prices will not fall as much as wages because of the cost of imports. So uh, it's actually a depressing thing to do and it makes the situation worse. And it makes the situation worse unless you do the other side of the coin, expanding demand. You need two policies. You need changing exchange rates so as to divert demand to the right places. And you need the expanded demand that you're trying to divert. The problem with the wage reduction policy is it does one of these. And one of these has bad effects. It uh, makes things worse. Well, in any case, the European Union appears to oppose both of these things. Uh, and I, I think changing the exchange rates would, if you just look abstractly at the situation, don't think of the uh, political element in the existence of the monetary union and the difficult transition problems of uh, changing from a common currency. If you ignore these, it looks as though devaluations are a much easier way of making the appropriate reduction adjustments in costs. But fiscal restrictions make it impossible to expand demand sufficiently, apparently. So that's why I'm suggesting that the following policy needs considered, at least, that nations would leave the euro, pay consumer subsidies. How could they do that? Well, they can uh, use money. They can use money if they have their own currency. And, of course, that would simply lead to uh, an expansion. No reason why that would increase prices there. Spillovers mean that there would be some impact elsewhere, and that simply has to be accepted, but it is moving things in the right direction. It's even possible that you'd need some more default, but I, I won't go into that possibility. Why is it not going to happen? Well, it kind of seems to me that uh, owners of capital don't like default and they don't like depreciation because, uh, of course, uh, devaluation is uh, a partial default on some of the loans, at least. Uh, workers, on the other hand, hate unemployment, at least many of them do. They don't all because uh, if they're not personally at risk of serious unemployment, maybe it doesn't matter to them.
And one of the problems of a recession such as we've got is that uh, wages may not necessarily be any lower when you've got this situation. Owners of capital appear to have controlled policy. So they've done things like quantitative easing, which since it is buying up assets, has the effect of increasing the value of shares, for example, and bonds. And that is indeed what has happened. It was a policy that did exactly what you would expect it to do, uh, which doesn't do any good for anyone except the owners of uh, shares. And even they may uh, regret it if they go out and buy them and then the interest rate rises. The workers, who owns capital? Well, of course, older people own capital because you save during your lifetime or you make lucky investments, if you're lucky, and uh, you get the capital. Who doesn't have jobs? Well, you know it's the younger people, roughly speaking. So we seem to be living amongst a serious age conflict. Um, so if, if that's the way it is, it doesn't seem to me that there's much scope for fighting for expansion and that flight is perhaps the remaining option. Uh, however, as I indicated at the beginning, the threat of flight might be a good way of fighting. That's to say, if the countries that are suffering seriously high unemployment, of which I think Italy is one, were to cooperate in essentially saying to Germany and its allies in this situation, Either you finance a very large expansion of, uh, in the European economies, in other words, you finance an expansion in the Mediterranean economies particularly, or we will leave the euro. Maybe that policy would work. Just what, I know that sounded like, uh, sounded like a conclusion. The next problem to come. So it's looking even. <laughs> Any economist worth his salt should not be content with solving the short run problem. <laughs> There's another one. And it's not one that people haven't noticed, but they haven't noticed it's going to get worse. If we were to reach a state of satisfactorily full employment, you see, it's part of the policies I've been talking about that wages are going to have to come down. And I mean real wages. I mean that people will have less in their pockets when they go working. Uh, that means a worse distribution of incomes. Inequality will be increased. That has been happening most notably in the United States and in China. Uh, China may be correcting that now, but for many years wages rose quite slowly compared to, wage rates rose quite slowly compared to GDP per head. And uh, that meant more and more inequality. Uh, in the USA, there's been rising inequality with real wages, uh, particularly at the lower end, not really coming up at all, whereas GDP rose quite a lot. And there'll be more and more of that. And it seems to me this puts redistributive taxation and the level of benefits and things like that very much on the agenda might be done through redistributive pensions. High tax rates on the very rich aren't likely to achieve enough. Seems to me the taxes would have to bite at least half the population. And I hope they will bear it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimmy enlightening uh, lecture as you were kind enough to not to take entirely the time that was allotted to your presentation and also you spent a few days with us you were kind enough also to come to several of the uh, meetings and the conferences of this uh, festival uh, I would like just to take uh, the advantage of being here to perhaps ask you a question just to open up the discussion then be before we open the floor uh, for discussion uh, I think a common statement being made in uh, many of the presentations at the festival has been that uh, this is now 
by now, uh, a banking crisis, a financial crisis. It could have been once upon a time. A housing crisis could have been once upon a time. Uh, a debt crisis, but now it is basically a banking crisis. And the economies are suffering because uh, families and firms cannot have access to credit. And uh, also, there is a, a sort of devil loop between banks and sovereign debt, uh, so that the two are so strictly linked. In Italian, we have an expression for this, abbraccio mortale, when the two things are together, and if you do something, uh, you know, there could be a collapse of the two. So the question is, aren't you worried, yet, given these circumstances, um, breaking the euro would not create a situation in which there is a chain of bank failures across Europe. And if this happened, you would have also countries that having been default would not have access to credit and to uh, basically uh, uh, capital outside because basically when you go default there is a time in which you you are spread you know if we, we were talking about spread you know the spread becomes goes to infinity because basically it's no longer possible to finance you internationally so isn't there a risk of this type you know along with the uh, you know the pos possible benefits that you were mentioning yeah, uh, un unquestionably, there, there is a, a serious issue here, and uh, it's one that nothing that I'd said helps with particularly. Um, and, and it, of course, what I, I'm to some extent suggesting is that even although that problem is there, that uh, still the root of the current situation is deficient demand. And uh, so that is still something to be corrected. In, in correcting that, I don't know that it would very much help the, the situation with, uh, with, with banks. Although, of course, a, a growing economy would be less likely to have a uh, bank problem. On the other hand, I mean, it really is a very serious problem because, as I had said in the talk, the ideal answer to things now is to get investment levels back to where they were or, or, or more. And uh, the problem resulting from the banking crisis is that uh, people cannot borrow in order to do that and perhaps no longer particularly want, want to do so. So yes, this, this, makes, this pushes the, the issue on to uh, the need for government deficits, which is not, not the ideal way of, uh, of solving a crisis, which is why, of course, people thought that they wanted to use monetary policy instead, because that is supposed to encourage investment, which it would have done if it had been done early enough and if the, the banks had not uh, got themselves into such a bad situation. Uh, uh, the, clearly the key question here is uh, to what extent then th there should be bailout and who are the people who should, who should get it. Now I like to look at the economy in terms of what's really happening, not the financial side. There's no doubt it was very evident from what I was saying. And if you look at it that way, then you're, you're saying yeah, there, there may indeed be uh, lots of situations where banks are going to have to be rescued, much like the, the British or Icelandic situation or, or the Irish. Um, and uh, in these cases, you can see that it is possible to, at least the Icelandic case suggests that it's possible to get back to, to lending. And uh, looks to me as though the answer has got to be what is partly restructuring, but that actually, unfortunately, we really have to do a lot of bailing out. And that may be the, the best way of deploying uh, the government deficits that I'm saying we need.
Credo di aver usato il mio jolly, quindi adesso apriamo la discussione. Okay, we now open the discussion. I would have uh, many other questions uh, to, po to put, uh, and uh, I'm sure that you too have uh, a lot of questions uh, about uh, what uh, was uh, suggested uh, by Professor Mielis. So we are open to discussion. Short questions, please. Please raise your hands. Secondo me sono tutti. Sulla sinistra. Ecco. Se potete alzarvi, vi ringrazio così vi vediamo. Please, could you stand up? Can you stand up? Economic Solutions Network. Uh, Dr. Melis, a very simple question, maybe not such a simple answer. Um, why do you assume that real wages need to decline in order to get full employment? Uh, you want to answer each question or you want to take a few and then? Prob uh, this is the kind that. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, that, uh, so it seemed to me wages are going to have to. F to fall in nominal terms within the country, and uh, that means will fall relative to international prices. So that was why I, I was saying that uh, real wages would actually... If there's a lot of increase in investment, and therefore an increase in demand, it's not obvious to me that you also therefore need to have a decrease in nominal wages. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I was recommending de devaluation for uh, a, a number of countries, and it was for these countries particularly that I was, uh, and uh, devaluation means a, a fall in, uh, in wages relative to world prices. And are you assuming that you want to achieve that by uh, reducing uh, the actual real wages in those countries and staying with the euro? Or is the idea that we're going to create uh, new currencies or return to previous currencies and have exchange rates internally within uh, what used to be the eurozone? Uh, I mean, uh, of, of course, I, I'm, I'm going to respond obliquely by saying that, of, of course, since I would expect that... Uh, getting out of the problem will mean there would be growth. So then that would be a reason for rising real wages afterwards. So I'd, but, uh, well, so I, I didn't fully develop the, the reasons why I think that uh, the share of wages is probably going to be falling. It's, be, I mean, it's because of the changes in technologies and the, the rather low wages. And, and above all, the question, the thing we have to explain is uh, why do we have rather high unemployment for low wage jobs? Uh, and I think that's because these wages are too high. And it's these ones that I expect to fall. And probably that's all we should do on that, on that question. Altre domande? Magari ne prendiamo due o tre di fila, vi ricordo brevi. Per... Please, uh, short questions. Hello. My name is Lydia and uh, I wanted to ask you about the role of the European Central Bank in all of this. Uh, do you think that it has acted in, uh, aggressively enough? Do you think it should have acted more aggressively and the situation would have changed? And what the ECB is doing now, do you think it's enough? And if it comes to the end of the Eurozone, do you think the ECB will save the Eurozone and will, like this blackmail that, that you mentioned, let's call it, do you think the ECB will buy it? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we take we take two more if you don't mind. So that okay. okay, two more questions down there, please. E là in fondo, scusi, eccola. E poi torniamo da questa parte della sala. Good evening. 
I know that the National Bank in the UK has acted pretty aggressively with the quantitative easing, lowering uh, rates, uh, and uh, issuing uh, a lot of uh, currency. This is what I read uh, on the website of the Bank of England, and that certainly helped uh, promote uh, the economy in the UK. Now, national banks uh, in the other countries uh, do not have this power, do not have this prerogative. Uh, and so perhaps uh, this is uh, why the national banks in the other countries uh, could not do anything. Another person down there? Good evening. Well, Italy is uh, a sick man. It's got a cancer which goes back to 2002 when it entered the euro, but there was an unsatisfactory situation because the ratio was 1 to 1 instead of 1 to 0 5. In concrete terms, the wages of all the Italians went down uh, in uh, real terms. Uh, and that's why we uh, suffer from this uh, situation. We uh, try to justify the bank's intervention. But let's be realistic. Uh, there is uh, no longer such a consumption as in the past. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, consumers are going down day by day. The situation is really worsening, and the savings of uh, households, of families, uh, are going down because people, elderly people, the parents uh, have to pay for their younger children. So this is the situation now in Italy. That was a comment uh, more than a question, I think. Well, this is, uh, mm, all very interesting. The ECB was the first thing I was asked about there, and um, uh, understandable to use the term blackmail. Uh, although I always feel that uh, uh, bargaining for something that should evidently be a, a good thing is not quite so bad as real blackmail. But uh, it, it, it's obviously something that would not be seen as uh, desirable by the ECB, which is uh, uh, the, the question is, is it changing, I think? You said, um, uh, do, do I blame, have they done enough? Uh, is that part of the problem? Uh, certainly, one of the things that the ECB could be doing would be to, uh, to lend to lend more, much more, to uh, say the Mediterranean countries, particularly the, the outer belt of, of countries that, uh, <coughs> that really need to be spending much more uh, as uh, government spending. Uh, now they are talking more and more of being willing to spend. On the other hand, they impose along with the rest of the Troika, they impose conditions on countries which say they can't uh, spend as much as they should. They've got to keep on with austerity plans. Uh, so that's the way it's operated. Uh, obviously, that is also an unwillingness to lend, but since they apparently have put 500 billion aside for the possibility of lending, uh, Maybe that means that they are genuinely going to be willing to do it. Although I've had doubts raised as to whether they would be able to, whether constitutionally it would be possible to do it with, uh, uh, <coughs> with Germany perhaps not accepting. Uh, the next question was uh, Bank of England. Uh, do I think that this is a great example to follow? Well, Britain. I know it looks a bit better than uh, than 
than, say, Italy or a number of other countries, but it's not a great example to, to follow. And uh, you might, well, somebody may yet say, well, if, if you think it's such a good thing to get out of the euro, uh, why isn't Britain doing much better than, than the others? And uh, that, that is indeed a good question. It's not as though the IMF is saying to Britain, look, you really must uh, have a, an austerity plan as tight as this. On the contrary, the IMF is saying, come on, spend. And that is the right thing to say. Why did quantitative easing not do it? Well, what quantitative easing is, is, is a method of pushing down the long-term rate of interest. It's using money to buy assets, bonds and shares. Now, if the money were used to pay for actual investments, if the government set up uh, an investment ba uh, bank of its own, which then lent people. If the Bank of England got into that business, obviously that's not a good idea, but uh, just imagine it, then that would be a very different matter. But quantitative easing in itself is not a great answer. It's quantitative easing combined with a willingness to then let the, the government borrow back what uh, use the, these assets that the central bank has got to pay for uh, people to work, to build roads, to do all the usual things. That's what's wanted. Italy has been sick since 2002. Uh, <clears throat> I understand that there, uh, I've, at least I've been told, that there was a... a, a private paper, perhaps something to do with the IMF, which tried to evaluate what the exchange rates should have been for countries going into the euro. And uh, Italy was regarded as one of the countries that had gone in at too high a price. That's to say they should have had a devaluation before going in. I think you were claiming the opposite. And <clears throat> certainly it looks nowadays as though uh, wages are, in a sense, too high in the country. And I'm always worried about saying that, you'll have noticed, because uh, I'm not in favor of people being paid less. Or rather, I'm not in favor of them getting less. But I think that they have to get money by employment subsidies, not, not by the cost to the employer. We have time for another round of questions, perhaps another couple of questions. I see there is a lady there. No. Now there is a person with a microphone. And please raise your hands when you want to make a question. Well, I participated in uh, some of the lectures uh, in this uh, festival, and uh, many scholars uh, suggested uh, liberistic uh, policies. Uh, but uh, I'd like to note uh, that uh, these uh, solutions uh, will not enable us to overcome the crisis, because it is a global crisis uh, where we have uh, competition between countries uh, which do not have the same conditions. So unlimited growth is impossible because it's uh, limited uh, by the environment. Uh, we uh, need to look at the environment. Uh, we need to uh, promote uh, non-consumeristic policies. Uh, we need to promote uh, the welfare state uh, because it it's a question of uh, a civilization. So lowering uh, wages in advanced uh, countries uh, is not acceptable. But we should guarantee emerging uh, states uh, uh, 
a similar welfare state as we have because there are uh, ineludable rights. We cannot accept that in the rest of the world, in the developing countries, there is such a divergence because between those who have and those who have not. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We understood. The option of leaving the euro, if it is just a theoretical option, but you say in practice we cannot do that. So if it in practice we cannot do that, why to think about it? Otherwise, if you would strongly recommend to leave the eurozone, what would be the theoretical and practical justification to do so and how to do so? Um, thank you. Thank you. Qui in mezzo alla sala, col signore. Professor, I wanted to ask you whether the states should, uh, or rather the banks should uh, finance the public debt and also shift money uh, towards uh, small companies uh, because uh, banks uh, have used uh, the money received uh, from the European Central Bank to buy bonds. Uh, and in Italy, we have uh, very small companies and they do not have access to credit. Uh, for what it's worth, I, I, I'm uh, a great supporter of the welfare state and I wouldn't want to see it uh, <coughs> diminish. Of course, one of the things that, uh, that has to happen if you have austerity policies is that uh, in, in various ways the welfare state is harmed. Uh, so one of the, 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 the question I'm asking really is how are we going to stop having these austerity policies? And how can we deal with the consequences of it? Um, then I, I didn't think that leaving the euro was just a theoretical possibility. But uh, the question does give me a, a chance to say a little more about uh, what a serious problem it would be. It's not a trivial task, obviously. Uh, and it, it's clearly harder to move out of the euro than to have moved into it in the first place, and that wasn't particularly easy to administer. On top of it, you have the problem that uh, the incentives are all for, well, i get back to incentives. Incentives are for people to move their money out of the currencies that are likely to leave, and uh, that would probably bring down the banks in these countries fairly quickly, unless it is organized uh, very quickly and very effectively. So, uh, so actually working out how it can be practical is uh, clearly an essential step, but uh, it, it can clearly be done because uh, similar things have been done before, say with the, the previous monetary union arrangements in Europe. But uh, the previous ones had the advantage that the old currencies still existed. But there were certainly serious costs associated with it. And I think it's, it's a great pity that this appears to be necessary in, in order to handle the problem. But uh, since the, the countries got into a system which has uh, very restrictive stabilization rules, uh, uh, the, that mean, has meant, in effect, that the countries of Europe have had to adopt Germany's philosophy of uh, fiscal policy. And uh, uh, that has been a very harmful form of fiscal policy for a long time. And uh, it's remarkable that their welfare state has survived it so long. <coughs> 
I don't know how much longer it will. Um, should banks finance the public debt? I actually think a lot of the expansion that's needed now could be financed by monetary expansion. Uh, but there's still going to be a, a further element that, that requires it. I, I implied that it should really come from the, the ECB. Uh, <coughs> but uh, that, that really comes back to the, the same basic. That is a bank that would be uh, financing the public debt. Uh, however, th this is clearly one of the problems with the banking system as we have it now, that uh, governments indeed, uh, I mean, it's, it follows automatically from their, very, uh, th their attitude to austerity, that uh, they, they try, that they actually do try to get banks to restrict lending and to make governments the first priority. So as soon as uh, banks feel themselves poor, then, uh, then you have serious problems. So it's, uh, it was a, a good point to raise, and I know that uh, all over the place, small companies have, have great difficulties. And uh, I think this is one of the most important things to try to get right. Uh, and honestly, the, the only thing I, I thought of there is a completely old-fashioned socialist policy on, on banking. And I, I think China and India are quite good models. Thank you. There are two very important things that Professor Malise said when answering, and I would like to go back to this point. The first aspect is that uh, we do not actually have a previous uh, situation of monetary disgregation. We did have uh, changes in the monetary system that were had uh, in Europe, and, and yet uh, countries still had their own currencies. So this disgregation of the Eurozone would be an unprecedented element, and that entails a number of practical difficulties in trying to understand what would happen in those conditions. And another thing, that I think needs to be mentioned in answering the comments that were made about wages is that we have high unemployment and unemployment especially hitting uh, the uh, l more poorly qualified jobs in several countries. And there is also one possible way which is that of uh, having a slightly higher uh, net wages uh, uh, f for workers and lower uh, um, costs, a lower cost of labor for the companies. So that would go through a taxation intervention or instead of having uh, unemployment subsidies, we should have subsidized uh, employment. So we, we do not subsidize unemployment, but employment. I think that this is a very important line of reasoning, especially uh, coming to the choices that have to be made uh, in our country. I would like to thank you so much again, Professor Malise. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Thank you for remaining here in Trento uh, throughout the Festival of Economics. And this testifies to the fact that this festival is really an occasion and opportunity for people to meet and uh, to share opinions and ideas. Since uh, this is the final uh, event of the festival, I will take the opportunity to first thank the city of Trento. Then I will thank people coming from outside Trento to be here. Uh, the contribution and participation uh, of people attending the meetings have been uh, paramount importance. Questions were very interesting, were very stimulating also for our speakers in considering things they had not considered until then. And the Festival of Trento is uh, possible thanks to the enormous effort in terms of organization and management made uh, by the Autonomous Province of Trento uh, that is represented here at its top level by Alberto Pacher. I, I would kindly uh, invite him on stage.
and then the municipality of Trento, which I believe is represented here by local minister uh, Maestri. And uh, the festival is a collective effort. Uh, uh, the editorial staff includes Innocenzo Cipolletta, Paolo Collini, and uh, Giuseppe La Terza. So thank you very much for what you do. It is key. And the administration is very effective and makes it uh, possible. Speakers are, are always happy with the organization. Uh, and so I would like uh, to call here a person who has a key role in this, and she stands and represents uh, all the other people uh, uh, who uh, participate in the, in the uh, organization of this. And it, the person who represents all these people is Marilena Di Francesco. And then there are two additional people whom I would like to thank because these two people, in a way, added uh, their presence to uh, the festival in itinerary. They were not present uh, in the beginning, in the first edition, and I wonder how we managed to, without them. And I think of Pino Donghi and Tonia Mastrobuoni, who have really contributed so much also this year. Well, thank you. It's wonderful. We started this uh, edition of the festival with a Nobel laureate, and we concluded with another Nobel laureate. In between the two of them, over the past days in our rooms, in the streets and squares here and in Rovereto, we had economists, philosophers, journalists, decision makers, and all of them brought message, an idea, suggestion, and um, a contribution for our reflection, also in defining terms sometimes. You see, this eighth edition, as was the case with previous editions, it was not organized to reiterate or confirm an idea. It is organized to put forward ideas and to uh, let each individual person find their way among all these ideas, to understand more, to get an idea about what is happening around us, and to develop an idea about how to get out of this difficult situation. So, of course, this is a challenge, but this results in a wonderful alchemy. We have important ingredients, um, the people. The people here on stage are extraordinary people. They put so much effort in this, so much more than would be needed. Passion is the key ingredient, a lot of time, a lot of energy and conviction and uh, uh, will to have this festival. And this is the very reason why we, everything works. I thank Tito Boeri for uh, recalling the fact that the festival is a success because there are so many people who uh, engage. Also, I think of voluntary workers, dozens of them. Thank you so much. And it is indeed thanks to their effort that all this can happen. We cannot draw any conclusion today. We will get the statistical data about presence and attendance. So we will come up with an assessment of uh, participation, but uh, I would say that what we feel and what we have felt of the past days going around in this city is that people really enjoyed this festival. You see smiling people around, people full of curiosity, eager to know more, and this is the important thing, because we had three, four important days of reflections and um, analysis, all this passion, all this uh, um, knowledge, all this expertise uh, is part of a biochemical uh, um, character of a festival that makes this festival unique, which needs, though, a catal catalyst, an enzyme, and the enzyme is people, the spectators, people participating in the festival, your curiosity, our curiosity, your will to understand more, to be there, to uh, tackle new scenarios, uh, to look ahead. 
it is the people of the festival that make this festival what it is. So I would like now to conclude uh, by saying uh, goodbye and see you next year, the ninth edition. In a few weeks, uh, we will announce uh, the new topic of the festival for next year. But I would like to conclude by thanking wholeheartedly on the name uh, in the name sorry of the organizers uh, and also in the name of our community the Trentino community so I would like to thank you I would like to thank you for attending for being here for asking questions for being here simply without you we would not have this festival thank you see you next year Thank <laughs> you.